Warning, this video has spoilers for the game Nier Automata. I wrote this with the understanding that the audience should be familiar with the game and has seen all its endings. If you haven't played the game or don't intend to, stop watching because none of this will make sense. Nier Automata is one of my favorite games, and like all of my favorite games, its soundtrack is one of the main reasons I love it. I never get tired of listening to it. And when I enjoy any sort of music this much, I want to learn more about it. I want to pick it apart and learn what makes it so effective, so memorable. I've watched several analysis videos about the game, and while most of them touch on the music, none of them dove into the level of detail I was looking for. So I saw an opportunity to put my music degrees to use and attempt to make... The definitive musical analysis of Nier Automata. I don't know if this final product lives up to that, but I can tell you this, my analysis did not go as expected. Part 1. Expectation versus Reality and thus I began the task of examining every song on the soundtrack with a fine-tooth comb. What I expected to find was maybe some logic behind the types of vocals used in the game, or if songs in the same or opposite key had any thematic similarities, or if a character or group of characters were represented by a musical element. But after compiling data of every key signature, every instrumentation choice, every vocalist used, every musical texture, every harmonic pattern, every melodic form, and most importantly, every appearance of every track and even the ordering of tracks in the timeline of the game, after scrutinizing every individual musical element of every track, I found no significant patterns of any kind. The more I studied, the more I felt like a conspiracy theorist looking for secrets where there are none. This guy's bonkers. I was so eager to find some hidden connecting thread in the music that would reveal some deeper meaning in the musical identity of the game, but the truth is, there is no secret ingredient. That's not to say that the soundtrack isn't good or that Keiichi Okabe isn't a good composer. Based on all the interviews I've read, it's apparent that each track was composed independently of each other for a specific scenario that the game's creator Yoko Taro would give him. However, Okabe wasn't necessarily in charge of where and when each track would appear in the game. This is evident when he spoke of composing Alien Manifestation for the scenario of the recovery units late in the game, but was surprised when he heard it in the opening prologue as well. When you observe the tracks with multiple appearances throughout the game, some of the placements make sense and others don't. Here's some examples. The track Treasured Times plays after you complete any of the quests from Pascal's Villagers. It's a very peaceful and simple track, the melody is only three notes. It's perfect for these scenes of getting to know these peaceful machines, most of them being children. On the other hand, a beautiful song, the boss track for Simone, appears in one other scene, when the Red Girls ask 9S to kill a few more machines before they divulge their secrets. Why is that? Why this arbitrary battle in the final dungeon? What do these two moments have in common? The enemies are completely different, our motivations are completely different, one could make the case that at this point 9S is acting out of obsession like Simone, but it seems a bit of a stretch. There's no point trying to work out unsolvable problems. Or how about Faltering Prayer? This song is originally from Near Replicant, used in a few tragic scenes, and it appears in two places in Automata. One is upon completing the quest for Condescent Squad, where you need to have at least 95% of your unit data completed to show to Scanner 4S. Once you do, a music box version of Faltering Prayer plays. It's naturally melancholy, reflecting the guilt 4S harbors for outliving his comrades. Personally, it also feels like a sort of sad goodbye to the player, since this is usually one of the last quests one is able to complete in the game. But the other appearance of this song is... can you guess it? After defeating Father Servo for the last time. Sure, he's one of the more interesting NPCs, but of all the tragic moments in this game, this song is only used here? Speedstar had basically the same character arc and he didn't get a sad song when he died. With questionable track placement like this, it's difficult to identify themes in the soundtrack beyond battle music or sad music. None of the characters have their own themes or leitmotifs, which is odd because Near Replicant did and some of those melodies reappear in this game to great effect. So it's clear that you can't analyze Nier Automata's soundtrack the same way you would a Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy, looking for leitmotifs and thematic development. However, there are a few specific instances where I believe that, whether it was intentional or not, the music can represent more than just what is on screen. Part 2. Supposed Symmetry So let's start with something that's almost a character theme. 
End of the Unknown. This track doesn't appear when you first meet Adam and Eve, but rather your second encounter in the buried alien ship. It really stands out as being the most electronic sounding track in the game. Because of that, I like to think it reflects how these humanoid machine life forms are more advanced than anything our protagonists have ever seen. The song appears in one other place in the final fight against Adam. What could that possibly tell us? Eve isn't present, so it's not a theme for the two of them. I believe it underscores Adam's ambition. During the fight in the ship, in his monologue, he reveals that he wants to study humans only because he's puzzled why they killed countless number of their own kind. We have dedicated ourselves to unraveling this riddle of humanity. The next time we see him, he believes the answer is that conflict is the essence of humanity. End of the Unknown triggers again as he uses 9S to go to be into fighting him with everything she's got so that he can experience death and feel closer to his vision of humanity. While we're here, a similar track I want to bring up is Copied City, the aptly named area theme for Adam's fabricated city. This track returns when A2 accesses the machine network in the tower and encounters the Red Girls, the manifestations of the machine's collective consciousness. So why use Copied City here instead of just continuing with the tower theme? The Copied City was created by Adam as his monument to imitating humanity. In the scene with A2, we don't see any city, but we do see the Red Girls acting like humans. As their consciousness becomes so saturated it fractures, they begin to disagree with themselves and destroy each other, just like Adam's interpretation of humanity. Some musical connections are more mechanical, like how Emile Despair plays against the Emile clones, but also against Hegel much earlier in the game. The only thing in common here is that the bosses are almost mechanically identical. What's interesting is that when you first hear the track against Hegel, the vocals aren't present and you probably don't recognize it's Emile's theme without the melody. When you do hear it with the vocals, it's being sung by a boys choir, just like our sweet baby boy in Near Replicant. The only other track featuring a boys choir is Dependent Weakling, the boss music for Eve. This vocal decision, along with the naming of the track, serves to illustrate how childish Eve is, both in how emotional he is and in how desperately he clung to his brother. The recycling of some tracks can serve as foreshadowing or homage depending on the situation. Crumbling Lies plays as 2B and 9S flee the fallen bunker. Given the title, it was probably composed for this scene, but it's also used during the pair's first sortie, from the bunker to the city. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of, they rhyme. The tower theme is actually first heard when 9S finds himself in the machine network for the first time after being knocked out by an EMP blast. While it may have been selected just as an ambient track, it can serve to foreshadow the final dungeon, as 9S discovers data the machines have collected, and finds clues to the ugly truth that awaits him. Speaking of 9S, at the end of routes A and B, as 2B has to kill him to save him from the logic virus, we're introduced to the track Vague Hope, Cold Rain. It plays at the end of a few side quests, but in the main story it reappears at the very end of Route D, when 9S is offered a place aboard the Ark containing the remaining data of the machine life forms. If there's a through line here, it could be that both these events show mercy to 9S. But what I really want to talk about is how the melody of this song is possibly quoted in another track near the end of the game. Perhaps my favorite song in the soundtrack is Bipolar Nightmare. It's so complex it's what inspired me to make this video in the first place. You first hear it in the prologue against Marx and Engels, then again against A2 in the castle, but I think that was just recycling boss music. I'm 99% sure this track was composed specifically for the dual boss fight of A2 vs Koshi and 9S vs Roshi. The name practically gives it away not only in the contextual setting, but also in the music itself. This track has two contrasting sections with two different keys and two different time signatures. As the fight goes on, the player's perspective shifts back and forth from A2 to 9S. I didn't notice it at first, but the first few shifts are timed with the music. While it may not have been the composer's intention, we can imagine that this first section of the song is representing A2, or at least her struggle in this moment. The women's choir sings with sharp, chant-like rhythm. This goes on until the song reaches the second section and our perspective switches to 9S. Suddenly the voices and rhythms are much more legato, meaning fluid or connected, and it immediately establishes contrast. The music wants to emphasize the change that's happened on screen. Not long into this section, we get our key change, and if you listen closely, you might recognize part of a familiar melody.
It's not one-to-one, -one, but it does fit in the chord. Again, it could be a complete accident, but to me, this cements the idea that this section of the song is representing 9S, or at least his struggle in this moment. Those are all the connections I found that make the most sense. However, there's one more I'd like to pitch to you that's a bit more conceptual. That concept is a bit too abstract for me to understand at this time. Part 3, Tinfoil Hat Time. The first thing you hear when you turn on the game is the menu theme, Significance. Its plaintive piano and distorted effects establish the musical palette of the game. But this track is also used once within the main story of the game, when 9S investigates the bunker server. Of course, the simplest explanation is that they just wanted a chill, ambient sound for this virtual space. But then why not use the regular bunker theme? It actually does play at the start of the scene. But once you enter the hacking space, significance begins. My theory as to why requires a bit more context. 9S at this point is still recovering from being held hostage by Adam. He's suffered not only physical damage, but psychological trauma experienced in the machine network. Knowing where 9S ends up, we can see these events as the start of his mental decline. Safe in the bunker, he runs some self-diagnostics, and all is well until he hears a noise, which prompts him to halt his data sync and investigate the bunker server. After finding some distressing data, it looks like info about how the Council of Humanity was formed as part of Project Yorha. Wait, isn't that backwards? He hears the noise again, which is revealed to the player as one of the picture book scenes. It's up for interpretation what 9S actually heard versus what we heard, but remember that the picture books are data on the machine's emotional development collected by 9S, but not this 9S. As explained near the end of the game, because 9S units inevitably discover the truth that mankind no longer exists, they are constantly being killed to protect the secret. Since these are androids whose bodies can be destroyed and they back up their data no problem, this means 9S's memory has been wiped over and over. But even if you do a factory reset on a computer, there are always fragments of data left behind. When 9S hears that noise, he's really hearing the voice of a former version of himself remnants of wiped memories buried in the bunker server. He hears the echoes of a 9S who knows all the terrible truths revealed later in the game, and here's where significance comes in. I believe this track wasn't put here to represent a place, but an idea. The first one presented in the game. Everything that lives is designed to end. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. This cycle of beginning and end is actually hinted at in the menu theme. If you were to play a significance backwards, you'll hear those vocal samples are portions of Weight of the World, the credits theme. If the player is not aware of this, it comes across as a strange voice you don't understand, but it's a premonition of what's to come. And 9S experiences that same feeling. He hears a voice he doesn't yet understand, but its source is the key to the very cycle he's cursed to live. Significance plays here to represent that cycle 9S is currently unaware of, but will soon experience firsthand. It's impossible to know whether all these things I've listed were intended by the music team. Okabe's approach to scoring this game seems to have been creating a perfect musical setting to enhance the action on screen, even if that music doesn't always relate to other moments in the game. If you made it this far listening to my inane ramblings, I commend you, and I hope that you have a deeper appreciation of this music and how it was utilized in Nier Automata. Writing this took a lot of speculation and brainstorming, and I'd like to thank Matthew Dyson, David Russell, Vinny Super-G, Storm Yorha, and the Nier subreddit for their input. It really helped having second opinions on some of these wild theories. This isn't the type of video I normally make, but if you'd like to hear me play video game music on percussion instruments, consider subscribing and following me on Twitter. Thanks for watching.